Good morning, everybody. Welcome to this week's webinar from Annika Digital. Um, it's really great to see so many people joining us today. We've also got a lot of people coming in from overseas who are going to actually be watching this um, later on in the recording. Um, I'm going to be handing over to Caroline Spence in a minute, who's going to be talking about uh, LinkedIn in your PJs, uh, perfecting your personal profile. Uh, don't try and say that when you've had too many wines. Uh, <laughs> um, we've also got some guests with us, Sam and Adam. Um, Caroline will introduce them later on in the presentation. But what's going to happen now is I'm going to um, run a couple of polls. That will give us time for a few more people to arrive. So I'm going to run the first poll. Um, I'm going to read it out. Um, and um, please do fill in a, a question and I'll read out the answers as well. So my, our first poll for today is how many times a week do you use LinkedIn? And the first answer is every day, two to three times a week, once a week, monthly, rarely or never. OK, so what's happening is as everybody joins us, they're starting to fill in the poll. Um, you should be able to see the answers on your screen. But when we do the recording, we won't be able to see that. So um, actually, it's a really interesting. Over half of you are using LinkedIn every day, which is brilliant. Um, so well done, guys. Uh, about another quarter of you are using it two, two to three times a week. And then we've got another quarter that are, are perhaps using it less often. I think that's a very good reason to be here today. So you can learn about how to improve it. So um, carry on fill it, filling in the um, uh, the questions to that one. And then I'll go over to the second poll. So my second poll is to do with your current employment status. Because this, per this presentation is about your personal LinkedIn profile, we're interested to know whether you are uh, currently employed. Um, you're not looking for a job, but you're looking for tips. Maybe you want to increase your personal brand. Uh, you're self-employed. Uh, you're a student or a recent graduate looking for work. Um, you're available for work. Uh, you're employed um, but worried about the future. For example, if you're furloughed, I know there's a lot of people still furloughed. Uh, you're a business owner or a manager of a team. So obviously you want to improve their profiles as well. And then other. Now, this is much, much more e evenly split. Um, about 40 percent of you are saying that you're employed. And you're not particularly looking for a job at the moment, but you're just trying to improve your own brand, which is quite understandable. Another 20 percent of you are business owners or a manager of a team. So you're sort of more interested in perfecting and helping the rest of your, the team on your own brand as well. And then it's a pretty even split as um, split between the rest of them. OK, well, I think that's great for now. I'm going to pass over to Caroline. Uh, just a couple of other notes. You will be getting the um, video later on this afternoon, so we will be recording it. Um, please carry on writing any questions either in the Q&A &A section on the right hand side or in the chat section. And I'll pass you over to Caroline and I'm going to mute my mic. So I'll speak to you all later. OK, thanks very much. Anne, and um, thank you very much, everybody, for joining. And thanks for filling in the polls. That's really, really useful for me because it means I can know how to um, um, sort of tilt the presentation in terms of, um, you know, the roles and what you're looking to get out of today. Anyway, just a few um, notes about me. So I'm Caroline Spence. Uh, a lot of you all know me anyway. I think there's a few people here from DMU because I'm currently lecturing at De Montfort University. But also um, I worked at Annika as a client development director for almost seven years. Uh, I live in Leicester, so I'm currently in a lockdown, um, same as Sam and Adam and uh, lots of other people. Um, that's my other half and my cat who have joined me in lockdown. Uh, I do lots of LinkedIn training, um, normally to people who are at sort of C-suite level, um, and they're the worst, to be fair. So I'm, I'm expecting you guys to be um, kind of better than uh, that. So if you're not familiar with Annika, here's some of the brands that we um, work with. So there's loads of kind of uh, national brands here that you'll recognize, people like Palex and Experian, but down to lots of kind of local size uh, businesses as well. So what are we looking at today then? So um, 
First of all, I'm going to be looking at why we're using LinkedIn right now. So why is it particularly relevant? And I think kind of the um, the current crisis is giving us kind of lots of reasons why LinkedIn is particularly relevant. And I've got lots of stats on that that I'll talk through as well. I'm going to go through the basics. And if I guess there's one thing I want you guys to take away from today, it's probably the, the basics um, on your LinkedIn profile. So looking at things like the image, the biog, uh, how to make your CV more searchable. Then I'm going to hand over to my lovely guest speakers. And thank you so much for joining us today, both Sam and Adam, um, because this is a little bit of a departure from what we normally do at Annika, because normally, you know, we talk about the technology and we'll talk about things like uh, the messaging. But what we don't do is we don't do recruitment. We're not recruitment professionals. Um, and we don't see hundreds of kind of LinkedIn profiles every day. But both Sam and Adam, this is what they do for a living. And they're here today to share their expertise with us. So if you can all kind of have um, some questions ready for Sam and Adam, that'd be great. Because I'm going to do sort of a little interview with them. Um, and then if there's any questions from the audience, that'd be brilliant. I'm then going to talk about thought leadership and how to post relevant content, um, so some tips and also how um, some trends and things that are trending have changed because of the current lockdown and things that people are talking about uh, now. Then there'll be increasing your network and finally reaching out to potential employers. So this is particularly relevant for anyone who's looking for work or who's worried at the minute. I've put that at the end so that if we're running slightly over time, um, it means that, you know, if that's not relevant for you, you can bob out at that point. But uh, if you want to stay on, um, then you can do. So why use LinkedIn now? Why is it particularly important? So I've got these stats. These are the UK government um, statistics. Um, and these are from kind of the height of the lockdown. So these are covering uh, March 2020. Um, so for anyone who's, um, I know there's a lot of people who are viewing this from the States. Um, all the stats today are UK data. And I've tried to pull them from March and April wherever possible. Um, I'm sure you'll be able to find equivalents, though. Um, but this just shows the kind of scale of the job market at the minute and the fact that we're in kind of a shocked uh, economy. Um, you know, in March 2020, there was 1.4 million applications for you know, universal credit, which was a six fold increase from what they'd seen at previous levels. There was nine million people on furlough um, at the height of the lockdown, which is 22 percent of the working population. You can see some sectors have been particularly uh, hit hard. Um, so things like hospitality, um, arts and entertainment. Um, and you can see from the columns here, um, you know, there's total jobs based on 2019 figures, then the predictions um, of the proportion of jobs at risk, and then the percentage um, of those sectors which have been furloughed um, uh, for their employees. There are predictions of a 9% unemployment rate that hasn't happened yet, but you can see kind of there's waves of kind of, you know, redundancies happening. Just yesterday, Boots announced 4,000 jobs going. Um, John Lewis, I think, was 1,300 jobs. So I think early on, you saw the SMEs shedding people quite early, but now we've got some of the bigger sort of players who are um, uh, shedding jobs. So there's a lot of jobs at risk at the moment. But as the jobs market is suffering, LinkedIn is booming. So um, the fact that everybody has been remote working um, has, you know, done wonders for LinkedIn. Um, their latest figures, um, which um, have just come out, um, are showing that um, they've, you know, they've seen a 50% increase in engagement in March 2020. Um, so users are watching 4 million hours of content, um, live streams. Um, increased 158% from February to March, which I don't think is, you know, any surprise in terms of, you know, everyone's at home. Um, and also content creation um, is up 60% year on year as well. So they're having a terrific time. Face-to-face -face, uh, networking, business meetings, all the usual stuff, that's not happening anymore. So people are kind of, you know, they're all remote working, they're reaching out in kind of um, in other ways. So um, um, you can see here, uh, people are, are posting, actually have I, oh, I've missed a slide, I thought I had. Um, so uh, 
we're going to talk a, a little bit today about uh, using LinkedIn for recruitment um, and uh, job search. So 90% of recruiters um, are using um, LinkedIn. Um, it's really good for a recruitment process. Um, so if you get a job and LinkedIn has been part of that recruitment process, you're 40% less likely to leave during the first six months. Um, and I think that says a lot about the kind of the quality of the information that's available on LinkedIn um, both ways, both for the people who are being recruited um, and the recruiters themselves. I think, you know, Lots of people who are LinkedIn users are at risk at unemployment or are very worried at the minute. Or you can go on to LinkedIn and you can see hundreds of these. Oh, you know, I'm sorry to say I've been made redundant and um, kind of posts. This is because of the people who are on there. Um, it's a slight male skew. Um, it's older, 25 to 44 year olds. It's mainly kind of professional or white collar jobs. Um, so you're looking at people who are earning £45,000 plus, over 50% of those are on the site. If you're uh, recruiting for kind of, uh, you know, more manual jobs or trades, um, other kind of platforms are better, maybe Facebook. I know we've done campaigns uh, recruiting things like forklift truck drivers on Facebook, and that's been, um, those have been really, really successful. So lots of people who are LinkedIn users are at risk of unemployment. On the right here, I've posted one of the one example and I've sort of blanked out all the names, but you'll see hundreds of posts like this on LinkedIn at the minute, which is, oh, I'm sorry to say that I've, you know, my journey with X company has come to an end because of COVID. Um, and, you know, I've had a wonderful time, but, you know, I'm now um, open for work. So as you can't communicate in sort of a you know normal face-to-face -face way you know you, you, the people you come across on a day-to-day -day basis so you can build your network and hopefully find opportunities through um linkedin has become more and more important so um having an updated profile um and communicating through linkedin um is super important now so now I'm just going to go through um, the basics um and hopefully because you know 36 percent of you um oh what was it I can't remember what it was now. Um, quite a few of you, yeah, 48% are using it every day. Hopefully a lot of you have got this nailed down. But um, for everybody else, I'd say if you're going to take away uh, one thing out of this, take away these basics because this is the thing that's kind of, you know, will form the foundation of your presence on LinkedIn. So first of all, your profile page needs to look professional. So this is your opportunity to represent yourself. And if you're employed, obviously you're representing your company or organization as well. So it does need to look professional. So make sure things like um, your header, uh, your job title um, is up to date. And you've got a nice about you section, which is not too long, um, succinct, but sells you um, nicely. Tips for headlines. So, for example, if you are open to opportunities, um, and there are loads of people are at the minute, um, you can say so in the headline, but don't take out what you're currently or previously doing. So, say marketing manager seeking opportunities rather than just saying seeking opportunities, because people forget that LinkedIn kind of works a bit like a search engine. You know, people do searches. So, um, if you're taking kind of your keywords out and what you do, uh, you become less discoverable. So it will kind of hit the amount of people who can find your profile. Um, if you're in a customer facing role, uh, you know, lots and lots of kind of sales people use um, LinkedIn. Um, perhaps don't put your full job title if it's sales manager or something like that, um, because I think you're less likely to get people engaging with you and people kind of accepting your um, invitations to connect. Perhaps choose a softer job title, maybe uh, account manager, um, business development, those sorts of things. So, um, yeah, make sure to present yourself. Uh, correctly. Is your profile on brands? So for those people who are business managers um, or owners, um, it's quite nice to have kind of um, uh, brand creatives and assets um, that you can spread across members of your team, particularly those who might be customer facing or account managers, salespeople, those sorts of things, because it gives your uh, company kind of the unified look then. Um, as you can see from the the header I've got on mine, I've stolen this lovely kind of lion graphic they've got at De Montfort Uni at the moment. Um, uh, and that looks fabulous. 
and you can upload them really easily and you can click on the kind of little pen um, icon on the top uh, right. Also, you want to make sure that if people um, are putting your company, saying they work for your company, um, that that's pulling through and that they're tagging the company correctly, they're choosing you and that the um, correct logo is appearing. Um, you can see that little box um, that I've highlighted there that says De Montfort University in it. So um, companies struggle with this, um, A, because people don't do it correctly, but also if you've got a large company which has got multiple brands or you've had multiple takeovers perhaps within um, your group, uh, some of those um, uh, brands might not be consistent and so people have got quite different ones um, that are, are on there. So you just need to go through and make sure that everyone's doing um, the same thing. So any kind of company guidelines or um, Anna and I tend to go out and do training on these sorts of things to make sure that people have got um, you know consistent branding. You also might want to have um, something like um, a consistent um, a company biog so people are describing the company correctly um, and in the same way for anyone who doesn't know if you want to edit your profile it's dead easy um, you know if you go into your profile and this is um, a desktop screenshot and some of the ones screenshots I've used today from mobile and some from desktop um, for a bit of variety um, but if you go into the um, uh, the top right corner, you can see these pen icons, you can click on those and that enables you to edit each section. As I say, it's dead easy. Um, LinkedIn will always give you hints and tips. It's really quite intuitive how to use and it will tell you whether you filled in um, that section comprehensively or if you've got any gaps, it'll also guide you how to fill those in. So kind of go in, have a play, fill it in. Um, and yeah, that's the best way to, to start. Now, this is probably the most important thing and people get it wrong all the time. I'm always surprised how, how many people um, don't get the, the LinkedIn photo correct. Um, please choose a, a nice, appropriate image. And remember, this is for a business audience. So it needs to be <clears throat> a nice professional headshot. We don't want a full body. Um, you need to be an appropriate business dress um, and look smart. So. I don't care if you rocked that leopard print dress at the Christmas party. Um, you know, there's probably other platforms where that is more appropriate content. Um, <laughs> also things like uh, wedding and holiday shots, I see a lot. Uh, people in sunglasses, so that it skills their faces. Um, uh, the latest thing is Snapchat filters, which is really not appropriate. Um, and also um, things like family shots and pets I've seen in there as well. So if you're going to do one thing today, get your headshot right. OK, a um, couple of uh, kind of notes for, I guess, the, um, the current situation. Um, LinkedIn have introduced um, a kind of photo frame, which is hashtag open to work um, to kind of, you know, help people flag up if you are open to opportunities. So you might want to add that if you want to. Um, also, I know there's a lot of freelance photographers at the minute that are giving away kind of free headshots um, to people who've been made redundant in the current crisis. So that's worth a search. So, for example, in Leicester, um, there's a friend of Anne and mine's called Ben Carrick, who's a photographer. And I know he's doing this. So, you know, it's always worth a search and, um, you know, yeah, trying to get a new headshot. So if you're going to do one thing today off the back of today, do this. New feature that's rolling out this week. Um, I didn't have access to it at the end of last week, but I did, I think, by Tuesday. Um, but this is something I'm looking forward to, particularly as I'm a university lecturer and I'm constantly faced with like a register of like 30 names, all from different kind of nationalities. Um, there's a name pronunciation feature that's being rolled out. So um, it gives you the opportunity to record how your name um, is um, pronounced. Um, uh, and then people can play it back. So you can see on the little screenshot on the right, uh, there's a little um, kind of microphone um, icon where you can play the name. Um, if you want to record it, and you can go into uh, your profile. Um, this is from mobile phone. And it says add name pronunciation. Um, and you can record it. So if you've got a particularly hard to pronounce name and you're constantly repeating yourself, this is a really good um, function uh, for that. 
Okay, so your job title and role summary then. So when you're actually filling in what you've, you know, the jobs that you've done and the the, um, the role that you're in at the moment, um, these are really important for uh, recruiters um, and people who are doing people research. So because, as I said, LinkedIn works a bit like a search engine, so you've got to have, you know, the right kind of search terms in there. Make sure you're writing clearly and concisely. But also think about the key phrases um, that people will be searching for if they're in your industry. And also that you're including all the different kind of iterations um, of those, um, those key phrases as well. So, for example, there's a lot of people at Annika that work in what we call PPC or pay per click. But it's also known as Google AdWords or paid search or paid media. So kind of think about all the different words that you might be able to use um, and put in there that people could be searching for. Think about what you specialize in as well. So are there specific products um, or areas that you specialize in? Um, so people might be searching on, you know, experts in, I don't know, something like Agile or Prince2 or um, those sorts of things where it actually, um, you know, that will be a really active search term. Just think about, um, you could put those in. Uh, I've already talked about linking your roles to um, your correct company, so make sure you do that for your past roles as well. Um, make sure you're putting enough detail on. So, you know, don't just list things and perhaps give an example. Humans are programmed to uh, remember stories. So if you can tell, make your CV kind of tell a story, it makes you more memorable. Also, focus on where you're going, not where you have been. So, for example, if you're changing career or you, perhaps you're looking for um, a new role in a slightly different area, make sure your CV um, contains those key terms, because if you do it for your old role, then you'll only ever come up for the role that you've had, not the role that you want. OK, um, I was lucky enough to um, sit in on... Um, a LinkedIn webinar on Wednesday um, and um, Sarah uh, from LinkedIn kindly said I could steal some of these stats. Um, so these are the trending skills um, from April 2020 in the UK. So these are the sorts of things that you might want to um, add into your um, uh, uh, the areas where you fill in um, your profile. So there's some quite uh, generic ones in there but there's some specific ones as well. So kind of Think about those um, and which ones you might be able to add in. And then these are the fastest growing skills as well. So, um, you know, there's some, you know, some specific ones like Python. So, you know, probably not very many of us know about that, but actually presentation skills is quite generic. So think about those as well. And also, if you've got some time at home, you might want to look at those and think, well, actually, if they're the fastest growing skills, I might want to get some training in those. Who's looking at you then? So um, you can access this in a couple of ways. Um, LinkedIn will also send you notifications about who's looking at you. Um, and if you're um, looking for prospects um, or sales, or you're looking for um, job opportunities, looking at who's looked at you um, and then trying to connect with them and maybe if they're interesting, start a conversation with them um, is a really good way of kind of, um, you know, keeping tabs on who's searching for you. The box on the right um, shows what uh, in organisations have searched and you've come up in their searches. Um, and then you can see below that, um, you know, what your searches do. So are they a business owner? Um, are they a marketing director? You know, who are they? The box on the left. Um, so that actually gives you the individuals um, who've looked at your profile um, and you can either message them or you can connect with them um, as well. So that's a, it's a really good way of just seeing who's uh, looking at you. So finally, you can do lots and lots of things with your profile and LinkedIn's added loads of kind of lovely functionality where you can make your profile stand out. So um, uh, I've got a fan, I've got a, colleague at the university who's a big fan of the introductory video um, and brilliant with um, things like PowerPoint so you can add those via slide share and they'll appear on your profile um, put things like qualifications uh, um, you know membership of professional bodies any awards anything like that um, 
if you've done any LinkedIn learning courses, you get little badges and they appear on your profile and that increases the discoverability of your profile. So that's um, that's good to know. Um, think about what will make you uh, stand out. So if you've got any passions or interests uh, and also references. So make sure you, you can ask people, get a few nice uh, references because it kind of rounds out your profile as well. So there's lots of things you can do then, um, you know, additional um, to pad out your profile. So from, um, you know, what you can kind of technically do to kind of, I guess, what you should be doing. And at this point, I want to bring in um, our uh, lovely uh, guest speakers, uh, Sam and Adam. So have you guys got your, yeah, got the microphones working? Brilliant. So just to give them their formal introduction, so um, uh, Adam Nichols is director at Rosslyn David, um, so, uh, which is a marketing headhunter company. Um, so uh, they run tailored campaigns for each um, specific um, client uh, and go to the whole of market rather than relying on uh, a database. There is uh, Sam Green, who's talent acquisition manager for Encore Personnel. So Encore is a client uh, of Annika, so uh, we do their SEO for them. But Sam and I have known each other uh, for a long time. We found out through the magic of LinkedIn um, because we used to work together um, uh, a few years ago and I used to use her to do uh, my recruitment for me. Um, so Sam's um, she's talent acquisition manager and uh, she's got over 10 years experience and um, particularly working with graduates and entry level candidates. So I'm going to ask a few questions um, for Sam and Adam. Um, but if anyone else has got any questions, we'll throw it open to the floor um, afterwards. OK, so Sam, if we can start with you. Um, I mean, Encore is quite, um, you know, you've got sort of loads of offices around the UK and you look, work with lots of different sectors. I mean, how's the, the sort of the market looking at the minute? Is there some sectors that are doing better than others? Yeah, I mean, it's a bit of a mixed bag at the moment, um, but we're quite fortunate on call that we recruit for a lot of um, industries that have done really well um, over the last sort of couple of months. So um, the sector specifically that we um, specialise in that have been almost booming the last, you know, sort of, you know, six months have been sort of your industrial recruitment. So, you know, your food manufacturing. Um, we work with a lot of companies that um, they manufacture like healthcare products. And, you know, it's almost been sort of at peak the last sort of few months. Um, we also do a lot of like logistics and distribution. Oh, so sorry. Um, we do a lot of logistics and distribution. And um, so those kind of industries have been really, really booming recently as well. I think some of the areas that have been a little bit hit of late, but it is starting to turn now the last sort of couple of weeks um, is, um, for example, like your commercial recruitment, um, things like hospitality. But I think as we start to come out of lockdown more and more, I think we're going to see a real kind of shift and sort of an increase, um, you know, within those within those sectors. But certainly, you know, the, the ones that we operate in and we're very fortunate that we do because, you know, we've, we've seen a real a real increase from what we'd even you know, anticipated at the start of the year. So it's certainly not all doom and gloom. Um, and speaking to quite a lot of people that have, um, you know, worked in recruitment throughout the 2008 recession, um, I think a lot of um, industries, it's very easy to kind of get down on yourself and think this is going to be for the foreseeable. Mm -hmm. But actually, certainly for Encore, we bounced back really, really quickly after the 2008 recession hit. So, you know, within a matter of months, we were recruiting again. So it just goes to show that although it does seem a little bit bleak out there at the moment, there's certainly light at the end of the tunnel. Well, that's really, really good to hear. And mm -hmm. I guess, um, you know, in your position, you get to see lots and lots of um, uh, LinkedIn profiles um, every day. So can you give us some of the, the benefit of your experience and perhaps, you know, run through some of the, you know, common or most spectacular mistakes that you see? Um, you, I mean, you touched upon it before, but I think the main one for me is job titles. And it's a bit of a bugbear for me as a recruiter. And I think it's important to think about yourself as the person that's searching for candidates when you're actually on your job search, because the amount of times that I see um, job titles on LinkedIn, such as labour resource specialist or just general account management specialist. Um, and actually, they're a recruitment consultant. 
So I think by thinking more about what is searchable as opposed to the job title my company have given me is really, really powerful. Um, so, I mean, you see ones like, um, what did I see the other week? Digital Overlord, which is basically <laughs> a website manager. Um, I think the classic one is like, um, uh, or oh, waste disposal technician when actually they're a bin man. So I think, you know, you really need to think about, it might not be the name, the, the title that the company have given you previously, but think about what's most um, reflective of the job that you actually do. Um, and obviously that is gonna make you more and more searchable. Um, and just obviously touching back on what, what Caroline said as, as well, I think that's really gonna help you in your searches. Um, other things, um, I think, Similar to what Caroline said as well, your profile picture is very, very important. Um, no kind of Snapchat bunny ears and noses and all sorts. Um, I think also it's interesting to think about um, how people use LinkedIn when they're job searching. And it's, it shouldn't be just a duplication of your CV. In my opinion, it, it's a snapshot of what you've done and it's highlighting those key um, achievements and sort of key um Sort of skill sets that you've got so um i'd recommend a condensed version of your cv obviously make sure that it matches your cv so that when you're interviewing there's not a total disparity on there from your cv to your linkedin profile but one thing i think a lot of people miss out is putting the tangibles on there so think about you know i increased retention by 37 percent i achieved x amount of my billings last year so i think if you can put things like that on your on your linkedin profile it's really going to make you stand out amongst other people in the industry that, that are looking and are up against you for those same positions um and i think the other tip that i would give that i've seen time and time again when people are searching is they would they put on their um latest job unemployed mm. uh, one as a recruiter, I'm not necessarily going to search for someone that's put unemployed as their job title. But also, I think it's about putting on there the job title that you want to have. So then you're going to be more searchable for those jobs that you actually want um, to be going for, as opposed to just unemployed. Um, so I think those are sort of the, the main tips, the main things that I've seen that I think, oh, I would suggest people kind of, you know, take on board. Thanks for that, Sam. Um, also, I know you've got a, you particularly work with kind of um, sort of recent graduates and people at kind of entry level um, to the jobs market as well. Have you got any tips for kind of people who are in that position? Because I know as a lecturer, I've had a lot of kind of final year students come to me this year. You know, uh, grads positions have been scrapped, internships aren't available, all the normal kind of routes to market. Um, aren't available and it's quite a, a tricky jobs market for them. Have you got any, any advice for them? Yeah, I think um, particularly people with minimal work experience to put on their LinkedIn profile, I would say that any experience is good experience. So anything that you can do to enhance your profile to get that experience, such as, you know, even people coming on this webinar today, there's things like this that you can do to upskill yourself from home, from the comfort of your sofa. Um, and all of these things, these online courses, that kind of thing, are brilliant to put on your CV. Um, I think at the moment, any sort of volunteer work you can do to increase your work experience is brilliant um, to, to put on your CV there. Um, I think a lot of graduates that I speak to, they have got a very kind of fixed view in their head of, I want to apply for a graduate scheme. And I think that really limits people. Um, I think it's sort of the easy option. I think I don't know whether it's something that universities sort of encourage people to do is to apply for a specific graduate scheme. Um, mostly um, companies that offer grad schemes are the bigger blue chip companies. Um, but I think it's good for people that are sort of entry level that are just starting their career to maybe look at sort of SMEs as opposed to the larger companies. I think for one, um, the process of getting onto a grad scheme can be really lengthy and tricky and there's so much competition. Um, I think it's an easier process to get into an SME. There's less sign up, there's less levels to go through and they're easier to approach directly and speak to decision makers. So I would say consider looking at SMEs to get your experience and obviously I wouldn't say completely park your aspirations if you want to work for a giant blue chip organisation in the future. But I think to get your foot in the door, I don't think looking at small to medium sized businesses 
is necessarily a bad thing. And I still think it's a brilliant experience to go on your CV. Yeah, so um, just don't limit your options, really. Absolutely. And, you know, approach companies directly. And, um, you know, rather than applying through these very lengthy application forms online, I think sort of, you know, don't limit yourself to that. It is to keep those options open. Um, and with that as well, I mean, I did a psychology and linguistics degree and now I'm a recruiter. So um, I think it's important to not necessarily, you know, or use your degree to the best of your ability. You know, you've studied for years for a purpose, but think about where you might be able to apply those skills, not necessarily in the exact field necessarily that you've studied. I mean, I guess if you studied law or, some, or medicine, then absolutely. But say if you did business studies, you know, something like the recruitment industry would fit really, really well with that. Um, I think recruitment is an industry that a lot of people, you know, you don't consider. It's not the childhood dream when you try on your mom's shoes when you're a kid to become a recruiter. But there's so many different skill sets that you use. So, you know, it involves sales, it involves marketing, it involves customer services, it involves presentation skills, you know, it involves sort of, you know, finance. It it covers so many different areas. And I think, you know, it might be an area that, you know, some people on this webinar might want to look into because it does upskill you in a variety of different areas, which are really transferable then throughout your career. Um, and obviously at Uncle, we take on a lot of sort of entry level candidates, people maybe have just left university or, you know, it's their first job. And we do a lot with apprenticeships. We do a lot with, you know, like I say, you know, graduates who got their first job and we do a lot of training and development with them. So if anyone is interested um, who's on the webinar um, to get in contact and find out more, then uh, yeah, my details are in the chat box. Yes, um, I've put Adam and Sam's uh, LinkedIn profiles because it's all about LinkedIn today um, in the chat. Um, so you can uh, copy and paste those into your browser. Thank you very much uh, for that, Sam. Um, we'll go to Adam now. So, um, Adam, you work for um, Headhunter. Uh, well, you, in fact, you're the founder, aren't you? I think you own the business. I guess yeah, you I work am. for them. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, do, um, I do work yeah. for it. Yeah, yeah. I do. It's true. Yeah. Um, um, so you take a brief from a client and then you go away and then you search kind of the marketplace for people. So I guess, can you give us any insight into what makes particular LinkedIn profiles stand out? Yeah, I think this uh, first thing I would say is that everything I've listened to this morning so far has been really, really comprehensive. Um, and there are a couple of sort of things I'd add, but everything. Yeah, no, it's true. Everything that you've said is absolutely spot on. I think in terms of searching for candidates, I think Sam also touched on it that you know job titles and things are important in the sense that linkedin is used by a lot of recruiters to search for people you know um, and i think obviously i'm a marketing headhunter and i understand things like seo and keywords and things like that but for people who don't you know you've got to make sure that the the words that um you think people should be searching for to pick you up are on your profile so that's one of the main things i think that you guys have covered off really well um i also think something that i i see on linkedin that sometimes that I instantly sort of say you should change that is obviously you've, on one of the slides you've got sort of your job title and the company that you work for and then you've got a free text box that free text box should be about you and your job and your achievements in that company it shouldn't be about the company that you work for and I see a lot of people will go on there and they'll say marketing manager Nike and then the blurb about their marketing manager job is all about Nike and the brand and they sell shoes and all this sort of stuff when that blurb is an opportunity for you to go into more detail about what you actually do in your role. And all of those words are the sorts of words that will be picked up when recruiters and internal recruiters, HR people will search for you. So that's kind of um, one thing I would, I would suggest to people on LinkedIn. Okay. And you tend to deal with kind of more senior candidates, don't you? So, um, you know, people who've got a number of years experience or head of, you know, sort of director roles. I know from my own experience training of LinkedIn, it, it, people who are more senior who perhaps haven't been um, through a recruitment process recently or, you know, they might find themselves unexpectedly um, available to opportunities. What advice would you give them? Because they tend to have sort of a slightly more old and uh, yeah, not up to date LinkedIn profile. Yeah. So we've we've had in I think in the first five weeks that we ret we returned to the office, I had over a thousand people contact me to oh my word. talk about their LinkedIn profile, their CV, how to get noticed, personal branding, what they should put where, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So we launched something called the Job Search Gymnasium, which is 
kind of a one-on-one -on -one consultancy, whether it's a video like Zoom call or a telephone call, whatever's most appropriate, to talk about their, those individual people and their profile and their CV and what they're trying to achieve with LinkedIn. Um, and you're right about the more senior end of the spectrum, uh, sometimes too worried about doing their job and not focusing on their profile if the worst were to happen. Um, and what a lot of people have kind of taken away from the job search gymnasium slots, which is on my LinkedIn profile, you'll be able to see it somewhere, um, is that what's right for some personality types isn't right for others. For example, I'm very vocal on LinkedIn on the written form and I post lots of sort of written pieces of content, but I've never posted a video. And it's mainly due to the fact that the thought of me having to watch myself back on the screen, just I can't stand it, you know, and Anne knows me very well and knows that I'm, I'm quite a loud individual. But the thought of watching myself back on camera is just horrible. So that doesn't suit me. So what the Job Search Gymnasium has been doing is sort of having conversations with people and saying, right, you're an introvert. So let's talk about ways that you can expand your network without being really shouty. Or I'll speak to someone who's a creative director and they're all flamboyant and their hands and all this that and the other. So their approach on LinkedIn will be different. So I think, you know, as much as LinkedIn does give you these sort of stock standard, put this here, put this there, put this here. The personality element is how you conduct yourself on LinkedIn. Um, and that's different for everyone. I'd just like to add something from the point of view of an employer, because you've got the recruiters, but as an employer, the thing that's put me off is not what people do at the point that they're looking at a job, but their previous track history. So we had one girl who was really, really excellent social media candidate, but she was quite politically motivated and had some quite extreme views. And it wasn't even just something she restricted to Facebook. It was all over LinkedIn. Um, and actually I thought, well, the problem with that is, is those political views even though I agreed with quite a lot of them, wouldn't have been things that I would want to read about somebody who was an employee. Um, and similarly, you know, profiles on Instagram can be quite um, provocative. And you think, is that really in brand? So it's not just what's on LinkedIn. It's not just what you've got on there now. You know, you may have to delete previous posts if they're a bit, you know, a bit, um, you know, controversial even. Um, I do think people should show their personality. I agree with Adam on that. But, uh, yeah, just be a little bit careful. We've got a lot of questions. I think probably we I, – I mean, Adam, did you want to add anything else? Because I think Caroline needs to do the rest of the slides. Because I think yeah. we may go into more of a discussion at the end because um, you've still got a few slides to go through. Um, yes, Adam yeah. wants to add anything else. No, no. I, anyone can connect up with me. I will talk to anyone. I'll try and help anyone. So, connect up with me, have a chat, and, yeah, take it take it forward individually if that's what people want to do. Um, and just to add, Adam's the only recruiter that I've managed to get some of these really difficult technical roles with. So um, I do recommend both Sam and Adam, which is why they're here. Um, and also he's written some very interesting posts that literally have thousands and thousands and thousands of engagements. So I'm not quite sure what it is you do, Adam, but you seem to <laughs> Do you know, do you know, the only thing genuinely and this is the last thing i'll say the only thing i think that i do from talking to other people who have got you know sometimes better ideas than myself but don't get the level of engagement is i, I write how i speak so when i write something if i was to articulate it verbally it would almost be exactly the same so i don't put extra words in just for the sake of trying to make it look like a sexier piece of content i will just write it how i would articulate it if i was having a conversation and i think that in turn makes it easier for people to read it quickly and also easier for people to identify it because it's in more of a conversational format than not i guess that's probably all i'd say on that okay great okay so um thanks for the questions as well um if and um, thanks to sam and adam they're gonna sort of disappear for a little bit but hopefully we can bring them back at the end for um a, a more in-depth q a i'm just conscious that um we're sort of um, we're slightly behind time. and I want to get through um, all of the slides. So um, thank you, um, Sam and Adam. Um, we'll speak to you um, again in a bit. OK, so um, I'm just going to go through some um, some content and some sort of thought leadership um, slides uh, now. So um, I'll keep these fairly brief. So why do people link, uh, visit LinkedIn? And I think this is important for, um, you know, when you're producing your content. So people, um, it's a professional network. So people are coming in for uh, business related information and they're in the mindset to um, receive more in-depth information. So 
you know, this isn't kind of Twitter where it's a very short form or um, Instagram where everything's very visual. Um, you know, even though you need to be sort of concise and it's great if things are visually attractive, but uh, people are coming in, they want kind of specific technical um, in-depth information. It's great for research. So loads of people um, research people, companies, suppliers, competitors. So building trust on LinkedIn and having lots of trust signals on there um, is really important. Um, people come on to seek knowledge in their areas of expertise, so thought leadership. Um, and these are all things that are important to remember when you're creating your um, own content. So a few changes and trends from um, the recent kind of crisis. So as I said, LinkedIn is doing incredibly well. Conversations are up about 55% year on year. Um, and some of the topics that you'll see um, that people are um, creating content on and engaging with, I mean, they're fairly obvious. Um, you know, things like remote working at 52%, video streaming at 71%, uh, business continuity, software, those sorts of things. But, um, you know, these topics are kind of hot topics now. Um, and these are the ones that are seeing the biggest rises. Also, kind of hashtags like marketing and leadership um, are now in the top five. So it's worth bearing those topics in mind when uh, creating your own content. Also, um, if you're a business owner or manager, um, because people are remote working, and I think the remote working thing is going to, I mean, a lot of people are going back, but I think there'll be a higher proportion of people who remain remote working. Um, people are building LinkedIn into their internal comm strategies because, you know, you don't have that kind of water cooler moment. You know, you don't have those kind of chats with people. Um, you know, you're probably having less kind of internal meetings and the kind of the normal sort of messaging that would flow um, from your business is probably less. And particularly if you've got people who are on furlough um, and so they're not reading kind of company emails and things like that. So um, getting messages out via LinkedIn is a really good way of kind of reaching your employees. Um, there's a, an example on the right here that Anne did for Annika. So this is something where um, Annika is now offering um, more flexible working um, and you can choose to work from home for four or five days a week. I think it's fair to say, and I don't know whether Anne would, would agree or disagree with me, that, that probably if we made that decision a year, 18 months ago, it probably wouldn't have been something that we'd put on LinkedIn. It's probably something that would have remained <clears throat> an internal decision um, and would have told the staff, uh, but we might not have put it on um, social media. So I think, you know, you can see um, trends are changing in that direction. HR and CSR posts have always done well, but I think you're seeing that even more so now. <clears throat> Um, there's been lots of discussion about how um, LinkedIn's uh, becoming the new Facebook, excuse me. <clears throat> You'll see a lot of kind of memes and, and kind of more personal content, I think, than you, you would have done previously. Um, and I think that process has been sort of accelerated um, uh, by the lockdown. As I said, people aren't having those kind of water cooler moments. Um, so I think they're sort of seeking out that kind of personal um, interaction with colleagues on LinkedIn. Um, and knows I've uh, uh, sort of taken these off her profile, but um, you can see the success of some of these posts that she's done, um, you know, where she's got sort of hundreds of, of interactions um, on things that are personal experiences. So, for example, her father um, recovering from COVID-19 and Anne's um, 60th birthday. So I think it's um, and it's fine to do this. I think particularly as the trend, you know, it's gone in that direction. But just be careful that you're not posting to personal uh, information, I think personal milestones and, you know, um, things that are important to you. But yeah, I think there is a line to kind of um, be drawn there. And don't worry, you can all buy me a drink when this is over. We'll have a big party. <laughs> um, so just think about when you're creating a post, um, you know, I've put a little picture of Donald Trump here because uh, he's always kind of, you know, putting his, his foot in his mouth on social media. Um, you know, before you create a post, just have a think. Don't kind of go off the cuff. Don't be, you know, super controversial. I know it works for, um, you know, there's some brands kind of, you know, Paddy Power do a lot of stuff that's that's kind of on the edge and a bit humorous and things like that, you know, but there's very few brands that can kind of get away with that. 
Um, also, I think, um, you know, don't talk about things like politics, uh, religion, those sorts of things, um, you know, that are very controversial. Um, you can get sort of interaction um, through kind of, you know, controversy, but it's not something that I would recommend. Um, you know, it is a closed network, so any of your connections can see it, but even so, you've got to be ever so careful. So it, particularly if you're a beginner, you know, be sure that you are representing, you know, your employer and its brand correctly. Um, you know, make sure you're representing yourself correctly. If in doubt, check it. And I will say, if in doubt, don't post it because you've obviously got some kind of, you know, question mark over what you're posting. Um, and then do sort of think, is it relevant to my target audience? Is it interesting? Um, most companies now have policies. So if you bring your company into disrepute through something you've said on social media, that can have consequences for your job. So do think before you post. Why should you post? Well, there's loads of reasons, um, you know, uh, to post. Um, so maybe client wins, external news like legislation or, or technical developments, team news, as I've mentioned, you know, anything kind of um, that you can tag other people in, um, you know, personalizing the posts. Um, and this, you know, goes into that personalization of, um, of content. If you can say congratulations to an individual or a group or a team or something, uh, that always goes down well. Um, seasonal content, um, you know, so if there's something that's relevant for that particular time of year, and then big personal uh, milestones as well. There isn't very many restrictions on writing LinkedIn posts. Um, posts can be up to 600 characters, which is massive, but do remember that you get 220 characters before it gets truncated and you do see the see more. So if there's anything um, you want to kind of write, make sure that it's within those first um, uh, 220 characters. Uh, there are, you know, kind of measurements for images and video. Um, just remember that um, with LinkedIn, kind of landscape images tend to work better because it's set up more for the desktop format. So it's, you know, different to things like, you know, uh, stories maybe on Facebook or Instagram where it's all very portrait, you know, that, uh, to be viewed on a phone. Um, just remember that, um, yeah, landscape images do tend to work a little bit better on LinkedIn. Um, tagging companies or individuals. So this is a great way to um, um, increase the reach of your post. Um, so you can tag individuals or businesses into your post. Um, they will be alerted. Um, so they'll receive a notification that you've posted something and tagged them in. Uh, and that's great because then they can come back and they can like your post, they can comment, they can interact with it. Uh, really easy to do. So when you write your post, um, you just press at. You type the business or individual name and a little drop down list should appear and then you can choose the correct one. Make sure it is the correct one because some businesses have got very, very similar names. Um, um, it's great. It means you can reach uh, a wider audience. Be careful that you're not uh, tagging uninvited or indiscriminately. You see some people who kind of, you know, they connect with people who've got large followings. So for example, like Anne, and then they'll just put Anne in on a random post because then, you know, it means that the reach is widened of that particular post. So that can be kind of spamming and it can be interpreted as kind of rude. Do add links to blogs, uh, websites, um, et cetera, so you can get more information. Um, and that appears in a little box uh, below the post. Hashtags, really important, and I see these used um, incorrectly all the time. Um, so don't add too many hashtags. So we always say kind of, you know, not more than six. Um, make sure they're relevant. Um, so um, LinkedIn's great because you can start typing a hashtag and you've got like little drop down boxes that appear. Or if that doesn't work, because sometimes that tech can be a little bit glitchy, you can put it at your hashtags in the search box and it will tell you how many people um, are actually following that particular um, hashtag. Don't make up your own hashtags or, you know, make up super duper unnecessarily long ones, um, you know, because it is so easy to check and put relevant ones on LinkedIn. Um, yeah, and it's really easy to do, as you can see here on the far right. Um, this was a post that I did um, asking questions and advice um, for this particular webinar, and it actually trended in hashtag webinar. Um, so it really is easy to do and make work. Um, so I mentioned, you know, 
LinkedIn's becoming the new Facebook. Um, and Microsoft, who own LinkedIn, seem to be kind of, you know, happily uh, uh, turning it into the new Facebook by kind of putting very similar functionality on it. So um, this is quite new in terms of the um, the automatic kind of uh, the post uh, functionality. So previously you could do a couple of these, but now you can do loads. So if you go to create a post, you can now celebrate an occasion. And then when you go into that, there's also, um, you know, there's one, two, three, four, five different options in terms of welcome to the team and give kudos and uh, project launch and stuff. So there's masses that you can do um, in terms of content um, with these as well, without too much kind of expertise um, or kind of research. Uh, other ones include find an expert, share a profile. So if, you know, friends are out of work and you want to share their profile and, you know, give them a helping hand, you can do that. You can add a job. You can create polls. And when this came out, like loads of people were creating polls. So um, it, it, they kind of got a little bit tedious, a bit quick, but um, it's still an option. Um, and you can offer help as well. So if you've got expertise in a particular area. So there's a quick checklist for writing LinkedIn posts. So, um, you know, this is quality rather than quantity. So fewer posts a week. So, you know, one to three a week, absolutely fine. Don't think you've got to be doing something every single day. Keep your copy short and punchy. And as Adam said, you know, put the social into social media, you know, it, you know, keep it professional, but um, it needs to kind of have a human voice to it. Um, if you can put images or videos, then they will generally perform better. Make sure that, you know, you can tag people because that personalization really helps um, and the hashtags will broaden that audience as well. Finally, um, you know, make sure that you're checking it with somebody else. Please, God, just do spell check it because you see loads of stuff with, um, with typos in it. Um, and also, if there's a call to action, if people uh, want to go and find out more information, where can they go? Um, engaging with posts. So again, more kind of Facebook type content, um, you know, uh, functionality here um, from LinkedIn. So um, there's lots of these different kind of um, reactions now. So you can like, you can celebrate, love, be insightful and curious. And there's a new one that's rolling out this week called support, which um, is the third one across. It's like a little hand with a heart over it. Um, Adam's particularly not a fan of this one. He'd rather there was a thumbs down option, I think. Um, but this is all about kind of supporting and caring people uh, um, during um, the crisis. So please do, um, <laughs> Sam's doing a little heart uh, uh, sign there. Um, please, yeah, so please do, um, you know, uh, engage with posts and react to them and comment on other people, but um, try and do it nicely and not after a glass of wine on a Friday night. So increasing your network, I'll skim through these very quickly. So the whole point of you know, LinkedIn is to, you know, it's a closed network, but you're trying to increase um, the number of connections. It's brilliant for researching people. And if you go to the search bar um, at the top, it drops down and you can see you can search by people, jobs, content, um, groups, schools and posts. So you can check people out um, really, really easily. You can then send an invite um, you can personalize the invitation. Um, we recommend that once you do that and then they accept, don't then follow up with um, an immediate sales pitch or request for an interview or something like that. Perhaps listen to what they're talking about um, and then um, engage with them in a constructive way. And then maybe you can start to bring up uh, what you actually want to talk about. LinkedIn's got loads of kind of suggestions for who you might want to link with. So um, things like uh, by organization, location, um, yeah, alumni from previous schools, similar roles. And you'll find all this if you go into your network tab um, and it's all kind of uh, on the left hand side. Uh, also, if you work for a big company um, and you've got like a department, um, you might want to indicate who your teammates are. So this is in that drop down box on the, um, the left hand side. Um, and this kind of orders your news feed. So it will prioritize your teammates news into your feed. And it means you can share and interact with that more easily. So that's something to do um, if you work um, with quite a few people. If you're new. Um, um, 
to LinkedIn um, and you've got a really good kind of uh, email list and you can add that automatically and you can do that from a, a range of kind of uh, different email systems. You can join relevant groups as well. So um, it can be an easy way with uh, of connecting with people who are interested in the same topic or part of the same industry. Great if you're in a really niche industry as well. Not all are relevant, so please check that it's the right country, for example, and the right industry. You know, apply to, to join, observe before commenting, but don't be afraid to leave if it isn't right. Um, but you can, if it is right, stay in and make those lovely relevant connections. Do's and don'ts. So don't spam. Don't go mad with kind of adding people. Do a few a day um, and also do them through your phone rather than through your desktop because um, they don't seem to count those as much. Um, whereas if you do loads through your desktop, um, they can um, suspend you <laughs> from doing it um, because it looks like spam. Um, start out with the people you know, so kind of clients, colleagues, and then start to build your network kind of um, organically. Um, you'll start to then get uh, invitations back in. Um, it's great to accept nearly all of them, but just be aware that there are some kind of fake profiles, particularly that come out of the, the Far East um, and um, some that come out in Arabic and things. So um, just be aware of those. Um, yeah, and also link with people who've got large following. So for example, people like Adam, Sam, people like Anne, who've got loads of kind of really uh, large followings, they're brilliant to link to because then they will um, increase the amount of people um, you can link to off the back of that. I always get asked this, um, so the privacy settings. So if you want to look for people and you want people um, to not be able to see that it's you, um, uh, there's different privacy settings. Um, so if you go into your settings um, and into privacy, um, there's different options um, for um, uh, your privacy. So you can show people that you're looking, um, you can just show that someone at your company has looked, or you can have completely anonymous as well. So finally, just on reaching out, um, if you if you are looking for work um, and perhaps you haven't done for a bit, um, there's a section that's called open to work on your profile. Um, and this is your recruitment settings. So it means that if you are open to work, you can um, you know mark yourself as open to work. This is a section um, that only recruiters can see. So if you're still in a position and um, you want to find a new position, um, you can mark yourself as open to work and only recruiters um, will see that. Um, you can also go in there and set different kind of um, automatic kind of searches for jobs um, and different locations as well. And then if you set those, they will then appear in your jobs tab. So if you go into the top um, and go to the specific jobs tab, this is the page where you would then manage all your kind of applications. So you can save jobs there, you can apply for jobs, um, they'll all be recorded. And also um, you can see I've done just lecturer jobs in like Derby and Leicester and Nottingham. Um, those searches will then be saved there as well. So direct contact. So a lot of senior roles, uh, particularly, are never advertised. So, um, you know, if there's companies that you're interested in working with, make sure that you're um, connecting with them and following them. If there are key contacts, um, you know, perhaps you can try and find out who they are and um, try and engage with them as well. Um, you might want to try something like email or direct messaging with key decision makers. Um, but I kind of wouldn't recommend that doing that sort of cold. Um, uh, I don't know if the recruiters will have something to say about this when we do a Q&A. But, um, you know, kind of if you're producing great content of your own and you're trying to engage with people in a natural way, um, you know, that's the way that you're probably going to get noticed. Um, also, virtual networking events. Um, so um, we talked about the fact that a lot of opportunities now have kind of gone um, to um, network, but there's a lot of uh, online networking opportunities now. So um, use that to identify local groups. Um, and loads of these are free and you can even do it with a cocktail in your hand. So that's it really from me. Um, there are, of course, other kind of you know places you can go to find information um, not just about um, LinkedIn but um, other kind of digital marketing formats as well uh, there's lots of free resources um, on I'm the website. Those up, Caroline um, oh, okay. so that people can see them on the screen 
it then allows them to click through. Um, we have gone over the 10 o'clock, but we will carry on and stay online. There's lots and lots of questions and answers uh, in the chat. And thanks for the guys for answering some of them as we've gone along. Um, but the first thing I wanted to make you aware of is that we have got a um, digital marketing 12 day course um, that we are starting in October. Um, so if anybody's interested in that, um, basically the way this one works is that um, we will be running the courses live actually at the training center in Frog Island in Leicester. Um, but people that can't get to Leicester can tune in live. There also will be um, a price which is about half price if you want to um, get the um, uh, recordings afterwards of these 12 days, but you wouldn't be eligible to take part in the exams. Um, which um, are included within the price of this this particular offer. Uh, another thing that we're doing for people, which I think a lot of people have found really helpful, is um, we've got um, free access to um, our training materials. So uh, the Annika Academy, um, if you want to click on that, we'll log you in and give you free access to all our training materials. Um, there's a couple of other offers which I won't go through now, but I just will mention next week's presentation. So next week I'm going to be doing the business side of LinkedIn, which is more about how you use LinkedIn to find prospect and sales leads. Um, but I am going to cover a little bit on LinkedIn advertising, a bit on sales navigator and how to integrate it with other software such as CRM. And I am going to cover a little bit some of the automation stuff that you can do. Um, but this is more sort of um, so that you know what's available. It's not necessarily something we recommend you take up, but um, you probably need to be aware that it exists. Um, so I think it's time to open up to questions. Um, they came in quite early on, actually. I think we've got more questions than we normally do. So um, I think the first question was where you found the data from uh, for the uh, where did the data come from? The original slides, Caroline? Um, so it's come from a couple of places. So um, I put a link on one of the slides, which there's um, a search engine journal article, um, the, uh, which a lot of those came from. Um, the ones which I credited directly back to LinkedIn were from a specific LinkedIn uh, webinar that um, was held on Wednesday. And I've actually I've kind of copied and pasted those slides in their entirety. Um, uh, yeah. And then. The uh, there's also a blog. Um, there's a LinkedIn report that they kind of issue um, on a fairly regular basis. And so a lot of the uh, LinkedIn data came from there as well. The um, the jobs data um, was that published by uh, the UK government. OK, the next question about the difference between your personal and your business page. So um, I think the thing that people don't understand is, is that uh, they do have quite different functionality um, yeah. and really you should keep them separate. Um, but what you notice is most people will have a very big personal profile, but their business profile will be a quite a lot smaller. Uh, the other thing you need to know between the differences is that you can advertise uh, content and posts that are in your business profile, but not in your personal profile. So what we often see in Facebook is celebrities and, you know, thought leaders or gurus will set themselves up with a Facebook business profile, but pretend it's them as an individual so that they can do advertising. So um, but it's it's sort of almost the other way around in LinkedIn. Um, so you definitely need separate um, separate profiles and don't try and, and use your personal profile for your business. Uh, this is another question for you guys. Uh, so this is uh, Sharon, who's, uh, I think, at Babington uh, in Nottingham. Um, she works with young people, 17 to 20, and many of them are doing apprenticeships. Um, some are on a furlough and may ultimately lose the job. I like to know how I can help them use LinkedIn effectively, given their limited work and life experience. So although Sharon might not be on the uh, currently here, if we could answer that question for her, so I think this is really relevant to everybody. Um, I don't know if that's one for you, Sam. Yeah, I mean, a lot of this I touched upon um, earlier in the questions um, with Caroline, but I think the main point is any experience is is good is good experience. So any kind of upskilling that you can do online and then obviously put that to enhance your LinkedIn profile. Um, I'm a big advocate for, Caroline mentioned as well, the videos that you can do, because I think although you might have a very limited profile in terms of your work experience. There's so much more that you can do to enhance your profile. And I personally love videos. I love when people approach me 
um, to ask me about job opportunities with Encore and they've they've really thought about their profile and they've really thought about how they're communicating and approaching me. So I think one is to make your profile and use the tips in this webinar to make your profile as strong as it can be with no matter what work experience you've got, anything that you've got involved in extracurricular uh, university, whatever it is, but then also be smart about who you're actually approaching and engaging with. And as I say, my recommendation would be to sort of the, the smaller organisations, the SMEs, um, to see if they have got opportunities there, even if it's on, say, like a part time basis, um, you know, further apprenticeships, whatever it is, would, would be would be my main piece of advice. Um, I just like thank you, Sam. I just like to add something else to that is the fact that the Kickstarter program that was um, advertised yesterday by the Chancellor or announced by the Chancellor. Um, this is going to give a lot of more opportunities. Um, Previously, if you wanted to have an apprenticeship and you were you weren't what's called a levy payer, a levy payer is the really big organisations that um, have to pay a, a, a sort of a tax rate based on the number of employees into the government. Um, so this is going to this is going to loosen up the whole apprenticeship market, which I think is going to make a massive difference. Um, the other thing that um, is going to happen is that people, if they are unemployed or their students, is is you know just don't take the summer off, get onto um, down to the job centre because you will then be eligible for some of these other schemes um, and you know businesses like us we will be taking advantage of this and we were going to have four placements from um, DMU this summer um, but we weren't able to take them on um, so as soon as we can get back into the office we'll start that up again so there will be opportunities again but remember um, you know if you it, it, it's almost too early to contact employers from one respect because they may still not have brought all their own teams back but if you start making those introductions and contacting people through LinkedIn um, like myself and you know other people within the organization uh, then at least you, you know you'll be on record and, and then you can come back in a couple of months and you'll get an idea of what their situation is uh, does any of the guys Adam did you want to make any comment or either anybody else want to make any comment about the government scheme It's, it's not something that we will probably be able to take advantage of because we're quite a small business. So there's only three of us here at Ross and David, and we're all kind of marketing headhunters who kind of look after our own clients. And Ross and David's a, a much younger business than Annika in the sense that I'm, I'm still trying to sort of focus my time on sort of making sure that everyone internally and externally knows of Ross and David for the right things. And what I wouldn't but want to do personally would be take an apprentice on unless I had enough time to dedicate to that person. So just yeah. to be transparent, I'd love to give someone the opportunity and it probably will be something we'll do later down the line. But um, excuse me, I probably wouldn't want to do it unless I knew I could dedicate, you know, 35 hours of my week to upskilling that person and making sure they've got all of my time. Because I don't th I don't think it's fair to take on an apprentice, you know, give them a laptop, a pen and pad and a phone and tell them to crack on because it's just not fair. So. I mean, we we we. I mean, we've learned that as well. And so, what we've ended up doing is taking on graduates who perhaps have done the DMU course or the Leicester University courses, and the and the local universities. So, from an employer perspective, because we have quite a lot of employers, the local university, wherever you are, will have schemes to help their the students placements. So, I think that would help. Um, let's 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 just answer a few other questions. So, where did you get the open to work picture frame from, Caroline? Um, okay, that's in. Um, it is available in LinkedIn. Um, I, that was actually emailed to me. Um, they did a, a, an email out. But I think if you go into change your profile picture, I think it appears in there. Yeah, there's an option at the moment I've seen just under the profile picture, and you click on it, and it says what you know what your settings are to be viewable to uh, potential employers. Um, and it's within that. So I think if you click that, then it'll add it to your profile picture. It was my understanding. Yeah. And and Peter said, "Does this stink of desperation?" No, no, it doesn't. I think any anybody who says otherwise, it, no, it doesn't stink of desperation. I think if if that's all you do and you've got a profile, you're not active on LinkedIn, and you go and put that green circle in, and then you bugger off onto other platforms, I think that probably isn't the way to go because all it says is that you're waiting for people to come to you. But if you're active on LinkedIn and you follow all the things that Caroline's been talking about for the last hour, having that green circle can only add value because if you're in networks that talk about topics that you're involved in, your profile's written in the right way, you're writing posts and content about your field of expertise and you're engaging with other people, and then you've got that green, that's perfect because all it shows is that anyone who's interested in what you're saying or 
likes your content or likes your profile or likes the work that you've done, it removes any ambiguity around whether they should contact you about work or not. So I think it's a good thing. I do. I totally agree. And I think from a recruiter's point of view, I wouldn't see having that sort of green um, sort of frame on the profile picture to, to highlight that you're looking for work. That wouldn't be off put into me whatsoever, particularly given the current climate. Um, like you say, it's a it's a fantastic essentially green flag for me to obviously go and approach people and I think you know there's been so many circumstances and so many people that I've spoken to over the last sort of few months who are absolutely incredible candidates through no fault of their own have obviously found themselves on the job market yeah. so yeah. I think it's a, a brilliant tool and I wouldn't think any less of, of a candidate in that situation in fact it would encourage me to engage with them more. Okay questions for Adam and Sam. Should you connect with someone who's a key contact a company who would like to apply to have applied to via LinkedIn? Is it best to connect a message or do I send an email? Also, I'm a marketing manager and charity trustee. Is this OK as my title or would it be confusing just to stick into marketing aspect? So effectively, I think there's some other comments about correct um, contacting directly, but also about, you know, do you mix your sort of charity work with your professional I mean, I'd my have, God, I'd have, you I'd do have the, both, but, you know. Yeah, I'd have the charity work on there because it's something that you do and something that you're mm -hmm. proud of. But if it's not actually your job, then have that as a sort of maybe um, an activity further down your profile. And, and to answer the initial question, really, really good question. I think something that Sam added to, off the back of what I said in, in the sort of chat box was that if the MD is the hiring manager, great. If he's the person who's got a vested interest in that role being filled, as in it takes – something off of his or her plate, then perfect. But your best bet if you're going to approach someone on LinkedIn is to approach whoever is handling that recruitment. So depending on the size of the firm, it might be an internal talent acquisition person. It might be an HR manager. It might be a head of department or it might be, you know, the managing director or the CEO if it's a smaller firm. Um, but I think you've just got to take the time and map the market a little bit. You know, look at the company, say, see who you think is best and then pop them a message. I don't think that's a problem at all. Um, the next question was, I'll answer this one, I think. Um, how do I optimise my profile for someone trying to switch from construction into digital marketing with a visible marketing background? So um, we do get people that, you know, literally working in um, Tesco suddenly want to apply for a senior social media management because they think, because they post in Facebook that they know what they're doing. Um, it is very annoying if they do it with a level of arrogance or naivety. Um, however, when people actually go out of their way to get the exams that you can get from Facebook and Google and make the effort to do the qualifications, they volunteer for a local organization, um, they write their own blog, you can see that they're actually proactively trying to target to get into that sector. However, if you're if you if you're 30 and you want to swap careers and you're competing with a new graduate who's just done a degree in it. You've got to re accept two things. First of all, you're probably going to have to take a pay cut. And secondly, you may well have to do the work for free to start with and prove that you're capable of doing it. So you've got to give me a heck of a lot of evidence as a, a, a digital agency owner that you're worth taking a punt on compared with somebody who's, you know, 10 or 20 years younger. So I'm very, very pro people swapping careers because of all the other skills that they bring in. But you need to evidence the effort that you're putting in into your new career. And as Google and Facebook and lots of other people, including ourselves, have lots of qualifications and exams, if you really are serious about um, uh, about moving from one career to another, you're going to have to invest in it. Um, I'm quite happy to open that up to the team if you guys have got anything to say about swapping careers as well. So I think it will apply to other jobs as well. I don't, I don't disagree with anything you've said there at all. I, I, I second all of that. Yeah, absolutely. And working in recruitment, I've seen so many people that have worked in other industries and then have moved over to recruitment. A lot of people that work, say, for our industries, they work in um, an industrial environment and work their way up to sort of management level. And then they've got that knowledge and expertise to move over to recruit within that field. So, you know, I've seen it so, so many times. And actually, we've had brilliant success from taking on people that, you know, have got another career and another kind of skill sets behind them that have then been really transferable into recruitment. So I've seen it successfully happen time and time again. Okay, so Chris mentioned about watching out for people that, um, you know, 
are basically using the concept of volunteers and placements as a way of getting free work. So you sort of need to understand um, the motivation behind the company. Um, you know, don't give your all your time and effort away to a company and then, you know, and get nothing out of it. So just just he's just sort of warning that some people can take the, take take the mickey, um, which I think is fair comment. Um, what do you guys think about certificates on LinkedIn profile? Do you check them because now there's a lot of students are signing up for courses? I personally don't because I just don't think it's relevant in, in the industry that I operate in, if I'm completely honest. Adam, do you check people's qualifications and certificates? Uh, I, I check them, and if they if they bolster their profile for the role that they're in, then great. But if you know, uh, I, don't, I mean this respectfully. If you're an SEO expert and you've got a A level in geography, they're not relevant. It's not relevant. You know, I think I, I, I look at them, but I don't, they they don't have any impact on whether I would or would not approach someone about a role it's more about their experience in role than their qualifications for me okay um, um can, I, sorry, can yeah. I just talk in there about like linkedin learning because it was a linkedin learning webinar that i did on um uh, wednesday um and the badges and stuff that you earn if you do like the little courses through linkedin um they actually make your profile more searchable and more discoverable so um those you know, if you can relate those to what you do and the skills that you've got, um, they're quite good just from a search perspective. And there's a nice little comment from uh, Lee Taus, who's um, our head of our BD, um, basically um, giving Adam another testimonial because he um, recruited him for the role that we've got now. Um, OK, so uh, do you think that the paid up version LinkedIn is worthwhile for somebody active looking versus someone active in a position? just available to attract opportunities. So I'm gonna cover uh, Sales Navigator next week. It's more looking for people with certain types of job titles. It has got more sophisticated search functionality um, and you can see people that you're not connected and it just makes the process easier to connect to them. It's gonna cost you 50, 50 um, about 50 quid a month. Um, you can get it on a month by month basis. Um, I don't know whether it, I mean, I've used it to look for candidates and I know obviously the guys here have got a recruitment version of this, um, which they use for looking for candidates. But I don't know whether it's worth the 50 quid. I think if we do some of the other stuff that Caroline said, um, it, 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 it really depends on how proactively you are going out looking for particular roles, I think. Do you guys have any comments on that, whether you'd recommend it or not? It depends what you're trying to achieve. Sorry, I'll jump straight in. I if you're trying to connect with people to message them and you think that they're unlikely to accept your connection request for any particular reason, then having the capability to in-mail them rather than having to wait to be connected is can be advantageous. But then there is also the logic that if they're not going to connect with you off the back of looking at your profile, perhaps they don't want to hear what you've got to say anyway. And I know I'm a recruiter, so people don't usually want to connect with me because they think I'm just a, a pest but you know it, it, yeah I know exactly well I, I got through to you a couple of years ago so I've done something right um yeah so I think if, you, if, you, if you're a job seeker I think the normal profile is enough because if it's optimized you're going to get people approaching you yeah I agree I mean, and I, I think I'll, sorry Anne. Sorry, I'm just going to say you get 20 15 or 20 uh, in-mail messages, connections for free, uh, with, sorry, within that 50 quid. Um, but actually, for me, that's not the advantage of using Sales Navigator or the paid premium version. It's the the, uh, the more advanced searching facility. Um, but, you know, I don't – carry on, Sam. What were you going to say? Yeah, I was just going to say, I mean, in-mails are great because they allow you to put, like, large amounts of information on that um, on that message. But you can still – when you obviously connect with people – and I, this would be another tip of mine is to not just connect with people with no message, is to actually use the characters that you've got, albeit sort of a, a small amount of characters, just to put a little intro on there. So, you know, I, I see that as – just as powerful as, as email, especially because, you know, the nature of recruiters, because we get approached, or obviously hiring managers directly, will get approached by so many people, they're not necessarily going to have time to read a giant email full of like bags of detail that you maybe took an hour to write. I think it's just as powerful 
to connect with people directly and then obviously add in just a little note as to why you're connecting with them and who you are yeah i've got some i've got some evidence for that as well because um i've been on a um connection boosting um i think i've gone from eight thousand to sort of ten thousand connections in the last three while we've been in lockdown and nice. i've been i've been connecting about 50 to 100 people a day with a message but i get about 25 percent to 30 percent of those people will uh, will connect back so that gives you an idea of you know your hit rate so it's about a one in three hit rate just while um, I've remembered it, personalised message to each person. While I've remembered it, I don't know if any of you guys have experienced this, but you can actually, if you're connected to someone, you can send a voice note to them in a message. Anyone ever done that? No. No. Yeah, so it's really interesting for someone like me who I appreciate that if I'm if I'm trying to you know talk to a company who are advertising a marketing role, I'm probably the tenth recruiter to approach them, which is fine. I understand that's the nature of the business, but I will send a voice. If, if someone connects with me. I'll ping them a note and say, thanks for connecting. I'm about to send you a quick voice note so they don't think it's a dodgy file or anything like that. And you can just record up to a minute of a voice note and say, hi, thought I'd send you a voice note as opposed to a big, long, wordy piece of text. And you can just play it through your headphones while you're getting a coffee or whatever. This is who I am. This is what I do. This is why I wanted to connect with you. This is the value I think I can add. It'd be great to have a chat with you. And really? injecting that little bit of personality into a voice note is much, much, much better than just write in a copy and paste message because if you're saying it in a voice note and you pick something out of their profile firstly it lets them know it's not automated and you've done it specifically for them and secondly a call to action verbally to someone in their ear that they can listen to is probably more likely to gain a reaction than just a piece of text but again I mean, it someone, doesn't suit everyone's profile so. someone I mean, approached always... me in that way sorry Anne. um if someone approached me in that way looking for job opportunity i would be mightily impressed there you go uh, i'll I mean, take that as a compliment to you, Sam. Is, um, <laughs> i mean we always do a telephone call um before we ever interview anybody um because you could get so much idea of their passion and enthusiasm and their general personality from a telephone call so i think it's just taking you one step nearer that process anyway um i'm just conscious of the time so let's answer a yeah. few more um, so there were some questions around which Adam answered about why there's a level of secrecy involved with the recruitment process. And that's because people try and um, circumvent them, which we all understand. So let's go on. Um, da, da, oh, yeah. And then you, you replied, Adam, that um, if they don't give information about geographical location and salary, then they're probably just a rubbish recruiter. Yeah, so, the, big, the, big, the biggest problem in our industry is that recruit, recruiters get a bad name because they start in recruitment and they've never done it before. And the person they're reporting into doesn't manage, doesn't manage them properly and train them properly. And that, that is the root cause of all issues. So it can't. it's just one of those things. Yeah, recruiters do, don't have a very good name for themselves. Um, and, you know, it's good to be dealing with some people that are really professional. And I think that's, that, that's why you guys are here today. Uh, there's some other questions around, um, uh, yeah, this was the question about sending to MD, which I think we've covered. Um, yeah, um, somebody here said that they're looking, they've, two, they've got two different career roles. Um, would I make two different LinkedIn profiles or would I you know how do i end i mean caroline's a classic example because she's still involved in annika so she's still got her consultancy training aspect of her annika role still showing and she's got a dmu role so is that the best way of showing the fact that you've got more than one sort of skill set or that you're involved in more than one thing i would personally say have it on have it as two roles that are current on one profile because yeah otherwise if i saw that i think right well who do i message because one of them might be a fake profile someone might have stolen that picture and some of that information to make a fake one and i don't want to message the wrong one so i would take some time to carefully decide which one to message if any personally but it's just yeah i, I would say have one you, you are you are one human being who can do more than one job so just put those two current roles that you've got on one profile would be yeah that's what, that's what i meant as well i, I obviously mm. didn't explain that very well so i think Sorry. we're all on the same page with that i think it depends on what what your intention is if you're looking for a job in a completely different sector and you've got a profile set up that's that's not representative of the job that you want to do 
then maybe in that circumstance, it might be a good idea to set up a totally new one that's just focused on the job that you want, but to not completely ignore your previous experience that may have some transferable skills there. So it just depends on what the situation is, in my opinion. Excellent. I think that's the last of the questions. There was just somebody clarifying about which um, there's more than one version of LinkedIn. So there's a career one, which is uh, premium career, which is £24.99. So if you are looking, that might be worth it. It's a little bit cheaper than the, the 50, one, uh, 50 quid one that I use. Um, is there anything else anybody wants to add? Um, before I think we with the... Um... With the um, enhanced profiles, you, I mean, a lot of the time they do freebies and I mean, they're not going to thank me for telling you this, but obviously you do get like a free trial. So you have to put your bank details in and then cancel after a month. So if you're on the job search, it might be worth doing that for that first month just to kickstart your um, your job search and then just make sure that you cancel it so you don't get charged. Yeah, definitely. And I think what, you know, build your network while you're in a job. Um, so when you get to a point that you're looking for one, um, which hopefully won't be, you know, I mean, most people move every couple of years anyway, is um, try and get those potential positions in your profile so you can contact them later on. Um, thanks very much, everybody. Did you want, I'll just pass it over to Caroline for the closing note. Obviously, well, hopefully we'll see you all next week. We will be sending the video around um, in a couple of hours. But uh, I'll just give Caroline and the guys uh, the final opportunity to sort of close down and say anything else that they want to. Yeah, can I can I just a big, very big thank you to Sam and Adam um, for coming on uh, the webinar and um, thank you for some very valuable contribution as well. So, um, you know, and you've given up your time for free today. So thank you so much for that. If anyone wants to get in touch with Sam and Adam, obviously their LinkedIn profiles are pinned on the chat. Um, and if anyone's got any questions, um, you can either contact me or you can contact Anne as well. So thank you so much for making this such a successful and enjoyable webinar. It was good fun. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Good. Great. Oh, Anne's muted. Okay. <laughs>